So welcome to Arable Conversations, where we're going to be talking about moving towards net zero uh, within agriculture. Um, we have five panel members today. My name is Kenneth Lowe's. I'm the soil and crop sector lead within the Safari Gateway, and I'll be chairing this particular discussion or conversation. Um, just quickly introduce you to the panel. So we have John Sterling from our Bicky Highland Estate. Uh, and he's going to be talking about the way the company operates and also the distillery. Um, and from the distillery, we have Kirsty Black, who is the master distiller. Um, Derek Stewart from the James Hutton Institute, um, who's a Safari fellow, but also is very interested in the circular economy and also food technologies. Um, and Wendy Russell from the Rowett Institute, who's interested in nutrition and health. Finally, we have Gemma Miller, who's a researcher within SIUC, and she's also a Safari Fellow, but with NFUS, and she'll be talking about conversations she's been having uh, with farmers and other people on their perceptions of moving towards net zero. So to start with, I think we'll chat to John first. So John, do you want to just explain a bit about our Bicky High in the state and also how you operate and where you feel this or your organization fits in the challenge of moving towards a net zero uh, environment? Yes, um, my name's John Sterling and we farm approximately 2,000 acres in the uh, east coast of Scotland. And then in 2014-15, we built a distillery. So, and actually the distillery has changed our farming philosophy uh, quite a bit in the fact that um, we now look with the distillery to be the most sustainable distillery, one of the more sustainable distilleries in the world, and that actually filters back to the farm. So when we now look at the farm, we've changed our rotation quite a bit. We've looked at more heritage type varieties of crops. We've looked at planting teas, and, and Kirsty will explain a bit more about what we do in the distillery uh, around that. But it's, it's now an ethos we've got in the farm. So our ethos now, is about how can we actually make things better from an environmental point of view and that has a commercial angle to it as well because the demand for crops and what people are wanting from the distillery is changing and people are looking to far more to see actually what's going into the crops what's going into the end product and that changes the way we look at farming we have we have major challenges um challenges about how do we actually recover record how much we're reducing the carbon footprint, but we're definitely on a, a path um, of path towards the movement towards a net zero. And and as we'll discuss later, there are there are challenges in that. But if you've got the philosophy and you start working with some of the people on this panel here, it's actually relatively straightforward to, to take quite large steps quite quickly and still have a very commercial farm. Thanks, John. Um, so, Kirsty, so John was referring um, to you and the need for high quality inputs to produce a high quality product. Um, how do you feel about this? Do you think that um, net zero is the target or are you just purely interested in quality? Uh, no, it's a combination of both. I think in this day and age, we have to consider all the environmental impacts of any decision that we make in the distillery. So obviously being based on the farm, like from the outset, we've got short supply chain miles because all the raw materials we use in the distillery are grown on the farm. Um, in addition to that, we also help reduce the farm waste because we use some of the not first class grade uh, raw materials. So a good example of that is our potato vodka, which is made out of what we would class, I guess, wonky veg. So the second grade potatoes go into our potato vodka. So we're turning that farm product into a high value end product. Um, but yeah, so no, going forward, everything we do now is based on sustainability and environmental impact. As John mentioned, we are growing peas now and using peas to make spirit as well, because they're very good uh, environmentally crop to grow. So it's quite nice then that you have a um, you, you have an ability to be using what could be yeah the waste um, production in the um, uh, within your product. Um, so Derek, so moving into your interest and your fellowship looking around the circular economy, how do you think this is going to change in the future? Do we need to be doing a lot, lot more of this? Or is there a risk that if we do too much of this, we're actually going to be taking something away from other areas? 
I think fundamentally we have to change the way we operate all our processes and includes include circularity in there and move away from a fossil fuel driven process. I mean, the implications of fossil fuel driven processes for climate change are enormous. So at the time of filming, the Arctic, has time, places in the Arctic have hit 30 degrees, which is unbelievable, purely driven by climate change. So we need to stop fossil fuel use. We can do that through circular economy. So, and if you bring it right back to farming, farmers are spectacularly good circular economists. They will reuse things very well. So I'm not going to teach my grandmother to suck eggs here. <laughs> the opportunities they've got are enormous. So Scottish agriculture is fantastic at producing cereals. So we've got a lot of straw and a lot of that straw is used, but we can use it for other things, but we have to think imaginatively. So one of the ones, I was chatting to a guy in Denmark actually recently. They take the wax from barley straw and they use it in very high-end cosmetics, particularly in areas in the Middle East where you need lipsticks that don't melt. Um, but so the value of that wax is absolutely enormous, but you still have the straw left to use for something else. Now that could be a feedstock for bioplastics, simple sugars. Um, you can use them for really high-end glues. Um, so you're only stuck by the imagination, and I think we've got the infrastructure across Scotland from the universities, the institutes, the small businesses to really translate that through, keeping that, a lot of that value back on farm. So the, the potential opportunities in there, and we'll probably see more of this as the Scottish Green Deal starts to open up as well. Okay, so it means that waste will no longer be waste in a large number of areas, which is good. Um, so if we go to Wendy now, so um, Kirsty mentioned about the use of, and John mentioned about the use of heritage varieties. Um, obviously there's benefits in the product they develop, but there's also must be other benefits from a nutritional perspective. Okay, so we're having a bit of sound issue with Wendy. Um, we'll go on to Gemma and then hopefully, yeah, we might be able to resolve this. So Gemma, you're working with NFUS uh, on a Safari Gateway funded fellowship, looking at some of the barriers to adopting these new technologies or barriers in um, moving down this road towards net zero. So what are your experiences with some of the farmers that you've been chatting to and some of the other key stakeholders? Yeah, so from conversations I've had, so they sort of identified three key barriers to, to meeting net zero. Um, the first one's around communication of research and translating research into practice. Uh, so sometimes the research just doesn't filter down to the industry, it doesn't have the reach that it needs to have. Um, and sometimes it's about how that research is presented. So is it in a form that, that's easily digestible? How long is it going to take the farmer to read it? Um, what sort of language is being used? All these are factors that can make a real difference. Um, and really communicating how that research translates into practice on the ground is a real key barrier. Um, the next part is around costs and risks. Um, so capital investment in technologies uh, that can help improve efficiency and reduce greenhouse gas emissions is quite a big barrier to uptake. Um, the technologies can be expensive, they might not um, and they might involve costs like annual software subscriptions, things like that. Um, farmers might not have access or resources to upskill their workforce to use the technologies, um, or the training might not actually be very accessible either. Um, and sort of wrapped up in that, there's a risk um, associated with making changes to operations and farms. Um, so making a change, it might take a long time to see that um, impact on the farm. And if it doesn't work out, it can take a very long time to reverse that and move on from it as well. So that's a really big risk. Um, so there's a risk, there's an element of risk aversion and resistance to change, I think. And it's really important that we get farmers, in particular young farmers, on board with the technologies um, and to develop good case studies because word of mouth in the farming community and um, sort of farmer to farmer endorsement is a really powerful thing. And um, the third key barrier I think is around um, media and how it can sort of fuel reluctance to ask, uh, to act and scepticism. Um, so there's a lot of negative press around the impacts of agriculture um, on, on climate change and I think to overcome that we need to change the narrative away from the current negative sort of rhetoric towards um, how farmers can be part of the solution rather than the problem. 
Thanks, Gemma. And I think it's um, it's interesting. One of the key issues is around communication, which I think we all nodded our head to and agreed with. And hopefully, um, yeah, events like this where please um, yeah, ask us a question, the horrible questions, the hard questions, the questions you don't think there's an answer to. Uh, and at least we can have a talk about it. Um, Right, Wendy, so we've hopefully uh, you've managed to fix your sound problems. So just explain the use of um, where heritage varieties might also have additional benefits other than just in the production of um, drinks. So uh, coming from a health and nutrition background, we've also been interested in barley, for instance, as a food, you know, it's extremely underutilized. Only 2% is eaten by people in Scotland. And interestingly, the land use and heritage varieties are much higher in the compounds that we think are beneficial for health, things, for instance, like beta-glucan. So it's really important for us not only that food is healthy, but it also helps Scotland move towards being climate neutral. And I just wanted to raise maybe another example of something we've been working on that we think is really important. So we've been looking at hemp. I mean, hemp has a really interesting nutritional profile. It's high in protein, high in fiber, high in micronutrients and minerals. But it also doesn't need very many inputs. And as Derek was saying, it's important that we can use all parts of the plant. Well, hemp can be extensively utilised. I don't think there's a part of hemp that can't be used. So you know, it really does contribute to that uh, bioeconomy. It's important that we kind of get these crops into society. But we know that change in the food supply system is really challenging. And one of the things we've done to address that is last year, we established the Scottish Hemp Group. And that's a group of people that includes farmers and people, actors all the way across the food supply chain that are working on hemp. And interestingly, within that group, we've been working with people, for instance, a Good Hemp, who put all the products into the supermarkets. But we've also been working with companies like Aurora Sustainability, who are making building materials from hemp straw, Green Grow, who are growing mushrooms on the hemp straw and also putting, in, putting them into their, uh, ingredients, their recipes. So, you know, there's lots of initiatives going on there. And we've had several innovative farmers that have risen to the challenge and have been growing plant, growing hemp in their fields. Uh, and so it does take time to climatise, maybe around three years, and they need to look at issues like shading equipment or harvesting. They're really motivated. And I think crops like hemp are going to be ideal targets as we move and try and work towards Scotland's climate agenda. That's quite interesting as well, isn't it? Because there are organisations like Ringlink, for example, that have a pool of equipment that can be used by farmers. So maybe that's where we kind of need some elements of integration as well to make sure that we can have shared resources that might actually be beneficial for farmers and actually, um, yeah, growing and harvesting um, hemp. So from what you're saying, then this might be a question for Derek, but is hemp is a is a viable crop to be grown in Scotland quite extensively or are there limitations in where it can grow? This could be a question for Wendy as well. Yeah, hemp, hemp has been grown extensively in Scotland in the past, you know, so there's no reason why it can't be grown here again. And I think maybe, yeah, Derek, maybe you could comment because I think you did some early trials in hemp, didn't you? Yeah, we did trials, oh, many moons ago, um, comparing it. It was mainly actually using hemp as an energy crop, so using it to grow and then compact it down as a fuel for combined heat and power systems and it was a spectacularly fast growing crop um, and it grows it can actually grow very well on marginal land as well so that where that's where it may make its benefits so you're increasing agricultural productivity without impacting on what might be the core or golden crops if you want um, so I think there's room for it and actually as climate change starts to open up or the impacts of it we certainly Scotland will start to see the agricultural land area expand as well um, so we could see crop diversification. That's it's, it's really positive. And I'm just going to go back to a point that John made uh, when he was talking about it. And this is tools. And we've spoken a lot or you've mentioned there about hemp. Um, and also, I believe that hemp is very good at carbon sequestration. So another question would be then John mentioned that uh, carbon accounting is something that he wonders about within his organisation. So is the lack of tools for carbon accounting is it really important to have them to actually know where we are and how how are you working to kind of like understand where you are in this change or move towards net zero so that's a question for john uh from from our point of view definitely because one of one of the problems we've got is um when we're planting something or changing the way we're growing is 
what actual benefit does it does it have? And and one of the great things about when we did our pea-based gin was with uh, utilising the, the Hutton Institute and other universities is we actually managed to put a figure on that. Um, and I think at the moment um, we know we can do things better, but how much better uh, is doing it a particular way or are there alternatives? And if we've got some kind of measurement, it doesn't have to be perfect, it would be a big step in the right direction for us. So, and just back to Gemma, so this is possibly something, I know that your initial Safari Fellowship was very much, Fellowship, sorry, was very much centered around livestock. Uh, I believe you're gonna be looking a bit more into the arable industry um, coming up. Um, is this something you might be looking at asking uh, about during your fellowship or where do you see your arable part of your fellowship going? Yeah, I mean, a lot is around soil management, isn't it? So, and actually in Scotland, I was quite surprised to find that our, our, the carbon stocks of our arable soils haven't changed much in the last 30 years. So that's a really positive thing to come out of this. Um, but it's also going to focus a bit on um, the opportunities and challenges that the arable sector is going to face um, caused by climate change. So the spreads of disease in, or, or increased disease risk, uh, but also things like opportunities to diversify crops and extending crop growing periods. So that's quite interesting, isn't it, that we did, did I think we're moving towards needing and having to adopt a systems approach, which everyone has done before. Farmers always use a systems approach. Um, so I suppose the, I suppose it'll be interesting to hear some questions about where you see a barrier on your particular farm. So we've spoken a bit about um, where the perception of the barriers are and the benefits that could be gained uh, by changing um, the things you do. Um, but I suppose the question is how how does that affect you? What support or what help or what information would you need as a farmer in moving towards that? And hopefully we can have um, a good discussion with the panel uh, and answer some of your questions. Um, just before we wrap up the conversational part of this and we move on to the question and answer, are there any points that any of you would like to make? So if you were, so I suppose I'm looking at John now and possibly looking at Kirsty. If you were to sell um moving towards it how would you sell it would you sell it uh, for example can you say um i don't know economically does it make sense or do you I mean do you have to be realistic about the time frames to look at it from an economic perspective do, do I, I i'll go first <laughs> and i'll let, let kirsty expand on that I, I would say um there's actually there is huge commercial benefits for doing it so we are we are a commercial farm so we must look at everything we do from a commercial perspective because there's no point of going down a route and we'd be bankrupt tomorrow. So there's certain things we, we don't do at the moment because we can't see a, a particular commercial benefit. But I would say if, if you start looking at the ethos of what you're doing and you look at better rotations and different crops and, and the impact that has on, there is undoubtedly benefits to be uh, gained apart from the general benefit to the environment and I think what is especially as important is, as a farmer we need to be growing and uh, supplying things that the consumer wants and the consumer tomorrow care passionately about the environment about global warming and therefore if you start producing um, items in whatever form it is that benefits uh, society and, and the environment as a whole you, you're going to be making, uh, you know, it's, it, there is a commercial benefit there. It's just understanding what these are uh, to take it forward. That's great. Kirsty, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I guess the distilling process and the products we make are just a continuation of that. Um, I think, you know, making things out of peas and other legumes aren't the cheapest option, but I think they're worth it environmentally. And as John says, end consumers care more and more about where their raw material, uh, their products, or food and drinks are coming from. So um, yeah, I think it's definitely worth it um, if you look at the whole package. And hopefully, we can demonstrate to other distilleries that there's alternatives out there, and to think a little bit differently about their environmental footprints. That's great. Thank you very much, 
everyone uh, for having this chat and then um, we'll answer some of the questions that will hopefully have come through from the farming forum uh, and also during um, showing this um, at the beginning of our arable conversation. So thank you.